After months spent in witness protection, Wes and Steve finally feel safe enough to come forth and testify about their latest episode of View the Right Thing. This time, they risk getting whacked by reviewing Martin Scorsese's 1990 landmark gangster film, Goodfellas. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you, I make you laugh. I go home and get your fucking shine box. To me, being a gangster was better than being president of the United States. Now, live from a safe house somewhere on the outskirts of town, it's time for an all-new episode of View the Right Thing. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Hey, hey everybody. We're actually back. Welcome back. View the Right Thing. Oh, he didn't say anything. He just smiled. He's just grinning at me funny over there. I've retired. Have you? I've retired it. That's interesting that you've retired it because I have something to show you. I've retired it for at least this one episode, and I just decided to retire it. And then I also thought, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't. No, I think it's good for this episode at it's, least. It's retired for today. Okay. Well, it's great because I have something to show you yeah. that I think you're going to like. And, and once um, I've shown, I've been waiting to to post it because I wanted you to see it first. Nice. And I then think I'm getting, is this, is it a forged golden ticket from Willy Wonka? It is not. Factory? It is not. Once, okay. once I show it to you after this episode, I will put it up on the Facebook page. Is it a picture of chief Martin Brody kissing, uh, Matt not. Cooper? None of that here. I'll, I'll just hand you my phone and you can turn it towards you. Oh, cool. You here got a goes, Spider-Man. Uh, that's not what case. you're supposed to be looking at. Look at the other side. If now. I had to guess that's probably drawn by, the- uh, Whoa! We have our mascot, and it his name is Indiana Jaws. There you go. It is uh, a very uh, straight frontal shot of a great white shark. He looks kind of happy. He looks kind of happy. He's got his mouth open. We can see his nostrils and his eyes, and he's sort of bursting through, uh, kind of a, kind of a. a a school of bubbles, I guess you could say. Yeah, as sharks might. And he's wearing a, a very Indiana Jones esque hat on his head, mm-hmm. and in very um, jagged, almost chaotic lettering, it says "View the right thing." Yeah. So, um, really, view it. Awesome artist named Glenn view Porter it. drew that for us. View it. View it. So now we have our official mascot. That was the Jaws theme, but with our you view it. Yeah. View the right thing. That's freaking great. Who drew this? Glenn Porter. Glenn Porter. He this is, is a masterpiece. He is such an amazing artist, and he did it as a favor. And I'm in I'm love with it. So happy with it. And I think, yeah, Steve, I think we might need shirts. I'll wear the heck out of this shirt. Yeah, heck yeah, right, dude. That's so great. It's really awesome. Has Desi seen it? Desi seen it. Yeah. Um. So Pretty I think sure. I think what we'll do is we'll let this episode come out so people can hear. That there is a, a mascot logo, Whoa. and uh, and then we'll like tease it a little that way, and then we'll, I'll put it up like a couple days after the. Yeah, I'm down for that. Up. That is so cool. Yeah, I really want to share it with that. All right, thing. and then uh, Ice Cube could be like, "There's sharks out there this big," from Anaconda. Okay, and then um, and then a local jail stopped by. Yeah, and then Robert Shaw be like, like, "You killed my parrot." Yeah, Robert Shaw's like twenty five feet with three tons on him. Or whatever he says, when Hooper says it's a twenty footer, and then uh, you like I look at this and I can almost hear Martin Brody. He's like, oh, and he's like, I'll uh, find him for tree, catch him, kill him. For well, dead. that's that's Quint that's says Quint. that. Yeah, I know. Martin Brody uh, probably has a good line in the movie somewhere. Yeah, well, he has the probably the most famous line of the movie. You're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah, the improv line. And full ahead. I can go full ahead. You and, come down here and chum some of this. Yeah. Shh. You can say and it. Then, <laughs> Jaws pops up right He's there. He's like, I want a hug. Yeah. What were you about to say? I was going to say, the, his other line is, uh, that's some bad hat, Harry. That's some bad hat, Harry. Uh, why do I always forget whose production company is Bad Hat Harry? That is, I think, Brett Ratner. Ratner. Yeah. Sounds correct. Because I, I, I feel like that was at the end of House. I'm pretty sure Brett Ratner that I produced think is House. correct. Yes. Hang on, I need to adjust myself in my chair. Don't put, laugh. Put the mic down. Put the mic down. Now he's just uh, 
He's adjusting now, and he's Sit up sitting straight. up straighter. And he's reach my reaching for his tea, and now he's got one tea in his hand and a mic in the other. That is a really great illustration of Indiana Jaws. It really is. He looks happy. He looks like he's in a fun, lively uh, body of water. He looks like he's enjoying his hat. And see, you've missed this for like the last like two months or so. Wait. I've actually had it on my You've been sitting on that thing wallpaper. for two months? Uh, when was the last time we did an episode? Some, since before... Since since just after we did our last episode, but we haven't wow. done an episode in a long time. Yeah, that's true. So where have we been? We've been all over, and that's what we're going to talk all about. So over. let's tell the listeners. So today, uh, this podcast is going to be a little bit about Goodfellas. A little bit about Goodfellas. because that is the last movie that we watched. The one we said you should watch. Yes. So we will talk a little bit about it, um, but we're not going to go into great detail because. It was my first time watching the movie, and yes. it was a while ago, and I don't remember it that well. So, yeah. So, Steve will have to refresh my memory, and then we'll talk. But we're also going to talk about other movies we've seen since we've been gone. There's and been a lot. Let's let's address the uh, shark in the room. Yeah, and that is, I made a declaration at the beginning of the year. We're changing the format. This is what's going on, and immediately, almost. Yeah. Uh, we had it switched on us by Destiny of the Bucket. Yeah, and then. Um, my life got a lot busier. Well, yeah. Um, I, I, working a new job, and cool. uh, and that's left us with a lot less time. This left is left true. With, and you are you were already tight on time. This is true. I kind of joined you in the tight on time club. Welcome to the tight on time club, my yeah. friend. It's a fun kind of club to be in. It gets a little uh, overwhelming at times. Yeah, but it's mostly fun. But doesn't this make every episode feel more special now? I guess. It, to me, it does. So here's my thing. Steve was always going to stick with the every other week. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to join Steve with every other week. All right. And we're going to go back to sort of the, the ju- original format. Uh, the original format, only one, <laughs> but only one movie. I, I, wow, I, all right. We, I don't think we can do two. I mean, if... We're both tight on time now. If Steve feels like we could do two in a week and uh. we could just release them every week... We could do that, but let's let's right now let's you know it's One all movie every two weeks. It's all fluid right yeah, now. It and works if, for how did this get made? Sometimes they go even longer than two weeks before doing re- a movie. Really, they don't come Sometimes. out every week. Uh, well, two of the main hosts are now parents. So, yeah. you know everybody on that show, they're all working on TV shows, this, that, and the other thing. So sometimes. Sometimes they don't come out with an episode every two weeks. I have been listening to that podcast a lot. If you, if the I listeners have not listened to how did they, how did this get made, uh, which is about bad films, right? And they just, it's just three, four comedians, yeah, just improving and talking about all the crazy stuff that they saw in a film. It's pretty wonderful. Um, the the one they did on the room was really good. The, uh, I've I don't think I've ever listened to a bad episode of How Did This Get Made. I mean, I've been listening to a lot of them. They're not yeah. all stellar. No, but um, but did well, you listen to the Sharknado episode? I've not listened to. It. I've been saving it. Can I spoil something? for Yeah, you? absolutely. There's one actor that they don't mention at all in the Sharknado episode. Is it you? And you're staring into his eyes. Oh, that's sad. No, I'm okay with it because they kind of tear everybody else to shreds. Oh, that's good. And so I messaged. Uh, uh, the host Paul Shear, Paul Shear, and their special guest for that episode was uh, uh, Earwolf's Scott Ackerman. Oh, okay. Uh, also of Comedy Bang Bang fame, of mm-hmm. course. And I messaged both of them and said, "Hey guys, thanks for taking it easy on the convenience store clerk." Wink. And they both just write something like, "Ha ha, oh that's great," or something like that. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty fun that they didn't rip me to shreds. That's good. I appreciate it, guys. So so we'll go back to every other week all right just you and i maybe we'll throw in some extra guests i yeah. that's actually something it's funny when you start listening to other people's podcasts and you go i like this about this podcast i like this about this podcast and thinking about how you can improve yours by you know borrowing or stealing from other people mm. um i don't want to just rip people off but like you know i do love the fact that um there's more than two people on how did this get made yeah and i'm i'm thinking maybe we need to We've done it once or twice where yeah. we brought another person in. Maybe we need to do that a little more often. It's possible. Just, just for fun. Just Then have... we would also have to try to coordinate three schedules yeah. to watch a movie. I'm set every once in a while. I'm not saying that often. I'm just saying. Right, okay. I let's just let's, let's just try to maybe increase it. I think we've we've done Yeah. How many movies have we watched and we I think we've only done it twice. We've had We had Neil and we had Desiree. We had Desiree. I wasn't here when Daniel was no. on. 
Um, I think we've only done those two times. Benjamin was in on that one. Benjamin's always here. Yeah. Hi, Benjamin. Haven't seen you For in those a while, that don't bro. know, Benjamin's the ghost that lives in my apartment. Have you told him about the video that you sent me when you got home a couple of weeks ago? I have ago? it when all the lights were red and we walked in and we heard the... Uh, we came home. Yeah. Nobody was home. Yeah. And all the, we have hue lights, which let you change the color. All the lights were red. All oh, I thought you meant they were my lights. Uh, no, no. I thought you meant they were Hugh Jackman lights. No. I was Wolverine. Yeah, that's funny. Good day. Um, so <laughs> we came in and the all the lights were red and the faucet on the tub <laughs> was on full blast. Full blast. I saw a video of it from the comfort of my own home. And I was a little unsettled. Yeah, it was unsettling. Unsettling. I hope, Benjamin, if you're hanging out with us today, I hope that was a joke. I hope you were just... Was it near Valentine's Day? Maybe that's what inspired all the red? I don't remember. exactly did that I'd have to look at... I feel like it was after Valentine's Day, but it might have been very shortly after Valentine's Day. It was after Valentine's Day, for sure. Because it was uh, after I started the job. Okay, okay. And yeah, it uh, it was definitely a mystery, to be solved. Um, I'm still happy to say my apartment seems to be ghost free. March since 9th. 2003. Wow. March 9th, 6.48 p.m. Ooh. That's what the video marker says. So, yeah. Um, I think I think this episode, we should talk about Goodfellas first, then talk about movies we've seen in the theater. Yeah, I'm down to do that. Since it's been so long. Although it's I don't have a ton so to talk long. about. Um, Cat people, David Bowie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Talk about Goodfellas first, you say? Yeah, and then and then we'll talk about a few of the movies that we've seen <laughs> in the theater since uh, since the last time, and then yeah, you know, then maybe we can draw from the Muppet Bucket and find oh, out what yeah. we're gonna watch next. That'd be fun. I can see the Muppet Bucket. The lid is the on Muppet Bucket, fast and securely. Yep, it's sitting right next to Steve. Kermit's looking at me. Like, I could literally elbow Kermit in the face right now, but I would never do that. Don't do that. Not to a real-life frog, not to a puppet frog. Good, good, good. Okay. Goodfellas. Goodfellas, 1990. Tell me what happens in this film. Uh, Well, it is based on the true stories of gangster-turned-FBI informant Henry Hill, who recently uh, passed away, I believe, in 2012. Um, I remember being a child when this movie came out. If this movie came out in 1990, I was still in elementary school and I can still remember hearing about Henry Hill. You know, uh, I was an elementary school kid who was allowed to listen to Howard Stern, which was fun. Mm-hmm. I can remember Henry Hill would call into the Howard Stern show, uh, from, you know, his secret, uh, witness protection, wherever town he was living, that sort of thing. But he would call in and say, Hey, it's Henry Hill, blah, blah, blah. Um, I know that in recent years he's done like, uh, speaking speaking engagements at colleges and stuff like that. That's weird. It's, you know, so yeah, for to go into witness protection and then still sort of seek fame like that seems like a, uh, you know, a, a, a less than great idea, I'll say. Um, but boy, oh boy, if it didn't lead to one of the greatest movies ever made, 1990's Goodfellas, directed by Martin Scorsese, uh, pronounced Sc- Scorsese, not Scorsese, as some have uh, joked. Um, Scorsese did not win Best Director for this, mm. and I don't even think it won Best Picture. But let me look at that I'll real quick, I'll unless that's up. what you're looking I'll at. I'll pull that up. All right. Awards. Uh, but yeah, I remember, uh, I mean, pretty much since 1991, everybody's been saying how Goodfellas was just totally robbed at the Oscars that year. Um, unless it did win, in which case my memory is drastically false. Uh, so this is the story of gangster Henry Hill. In this movie, he's played by uh, Ray Liotta. However, we spend the first uh, 15 minutes of the movie looking at Henry as a young boy. He's mm-hmm. a, you know, he's a kid and a teenager and stuff. And uh, he lives in an apartment with his mom and his dad. And across the way is the cab stand. And the cab stand is this notorious gangster hangout. Mm-hmm. And that's where Henry Hill gets his first job parking cars at the cab stand Getting paid in cash from a bunch of uh, New York City gangsters. Goombas. Goombas, as they're called. Uh, what's his name? Pa- Polly, right? Paul Sorvino's character is Polly. 
See, right now as I'm doing this, I'm I'm starting to confuse everything from Goodfellas with everything from the the Sopranos. Also, it had a bunch of nominations, and Pesci's the only one who won. Pesci is the only one who won a nomination from yep. Goodfellas for the role of Tommy. Yeah. So Paul Servino played Paul Cicero. He, so he was Paulie. Okay. Paulie yes. Cicero. Paulie Cicero, who would cut garlic with a razor blade. So Paulie Cicero was basically the top dog boss of all the gangsters we're about to hear about in this movie. Henry Hill starts working for Polly and the rest of the gangsters when he's just a little kid. And then one day he gets popped for, uh, what is it, uh, selling stolen cigarettes? And Yeah, they're like, loading up the car. The car. Yeah, and some cops show up and he's like, guys, don't you know who I work for? And they're like, uh, he's like, it's okay, guys, this is fine. And the cops are like, yeah, right, you're coming with us. So they send him to jail for a little while. He gets busted. He stands trial. All the, uh, all the uh, you know, the Goombas are there near the courthouse. Mm-hmm. They they watch him stand trial. He doesn't rat anybody out. What is it? He comes out of the courtroom. De Niro tucks 100 bucks in his pocket. He's uh, That's another thing. Robert De Niro plays uh, Jimmy. Yeah. Something you should know about Jimmy and Henry. Jimmy Conway. Jimmy Conway. They are both half Irish, half Italian. So they can't be made. If you've watched Goodfellas, you understand what getting made is. Or Sopranos. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's mentioned in all the mafia movies. you got to be 100% sicilian i think not even just italian but specifically sicilian and uh that's the only way to get made so jimmy and henry sort of have this uh not quite jealousy thing going on about how they can never be made but it's almost like they just can't rise as high as maybe they'd like to rise in this mafia world they have to pretty much always be somebody else's crew yeah and that's uh, a bit tricky for them especially for Jimmy, as we'll find out. So the kid gets busted. He doesn't rat. He's in good with the mob. American dream. So he grows up. He meets his wife, played by um, not Jane Kaczmarek, but uh, Lorraine Bracco. Lorraine Bracco. I almost said Rene Russo. Yes. Lorraine Bracco. She played Dr. Uh, Melfi on The Sopranos, who was, you know, uh, uh, Tony's uh, psychologist, if you remember. Um Man. So, so now Henry is played by Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta. I read yeah. that Al Pacino was offered wow. the role of Henry Hill, and he turned it down. Yeah. He didn't want to get typecast. Uh, I can understand and he, that. He um, took uh, Big Boy and Dick Tracy that year instead. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What a mistake. Well, I mean, Dick Tracy, you know, is a remembered movie. I watched it pretty um, recently, but not the for last the right year. reason. Not the way that Goodfellas is remembered. Right. I mean, it's, you know, Dick Tracy is a mobster movie based on a comic book. Goodfellas is a mobster movie based on real life mobsters. A book, yeah. Um, who I fully respect and salute for their efforts in in <laughs> building the American dream for themselves. Um, where the heck were we? Yeah, so now Henry's all grown up. He's dating uh, uh, Lorraine Bracco, uh, uh, uh Karen? Karen. His wife's name's Karen. Pretty sure. Anyway, you know, and now it's just full-blown mobster living. They're going to the nicest restaurants in town. They're getting top-shelf service out of everybody. Of course, she's really impressed because she's just like, who is this guy I'm dating? He's like 21 years old, and he's like treated like a king around here. Mm -hmm. Um, At one point... uh, Now, how they got together actually... You kind of glossed over that. He was a wingman for his buddy who yes. really wanted to hook up with this girl. For Tommy, and, played yeah. by Joe Pesci. Yeah, Tommy DeVito. Yeah. And so he um, he reluctantly went on this double date because the girl was Catholic or something. and I think Karen and her friends are Jewish. Oh, they're Jewish. Yeah. There was something up with their parents and stuff, and she wasn't able to go out by her with just the guy. Yeah. She had to take a friend. So he was like... He was the wingman. Right. And he didn't want to be there and he kind of he bails. brushes her off. Yeah, he bails he bails in the in the middle of the date or something, right? So rude. And so uh he bails to go do something for something mobstery. Something mobstery and he ends up back at the Yeah. At the restu- at the mobster restaurant or the stand or something, the cab stand. Some like hangout where yeah. uh Polly is inside usually. So you have seen this movie 20 times. You re- you've remembered us so much more than I remember. No, not that maybe much. Maybe not 20, maybe 8. So she so they're driving home. Yeah. And she's in the car and they see him and she like 
gets them to pull over Tommy and uh, his yeah. date. Yeah. To pull over, and she gets out, and she gives him what for? Gives him a piece of her mind. And then, of course, once that happens, and he's been kind of yelled at by this girl, he's interested in her yeah. all of a sudden. Edible complex. Yeah. Rrr. So they start a romance. At one point, he beats up uh, her neighbor from across the street because he got fresh with with Karen. So Henry goes over there and he beats the heck out of the guy and shoves a gun in his friend's face and lets him know, hey, you don't mess with Karen from across the street anymore. Everybody starts getting married. They start having kids. They start, you know, having mistresses. Uh, what do they call those? Gumars, right? Sure. Something like that. Um and uh, things just start getting all crazy now. Jerry Vale shows up at one point. Jerry Vale isn't that the guy that sing the singer? That the, sounds familiar. They go to when like they go into the they go into the club it, restaurant and the, they go in through the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that walking through the restaurant kitchen and everything. That scene has been often imitated, certainly never quite duplicated, but also often discussed in even even in other hit movies. It's a, it's in an, swingers they talk about. It's that an scene. unintentional scene. Yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't let him. They wouldn't let him come bring the equipment in through the front door. Wow, really? Yeah. So, yeah, isn't that weird? That's They're like, oh, weird. this is Scorsese. He, like, no, you can't come in the front door with your equipment. You got to go in through the back. So they wow. they like shot the whole thing that way because they couldn't shoot through the front door. I never knew that. Yeah, I thought it was supposed to just be this guy's such a gangster. He goes through the kitchen because it's a shorter line, and he just no happy everybody... accident. Wow, way to go, Marty S. <laughs> so the you're famous, going places, kid. <laughs> so the famous entering through the kitchen scene was a total accident. It was well, so, it, well, a, it a, became a, a workaround. It was a workaround. It wow. was not the first choice. That's incredible. Incredible. Um, so yeah, so you know, uh, in the movie Swingers, they're all sitting around the table at one point talking about film and mm. you know mentioning how you know Tarantino bites Scorsese and this that and the other thing and you know how hard it must have been to light that walking through the kitchen shot and blah 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 and then the very next scene in Swingers is them entering through a kitchen at some club where they have carte blanche. Anyway, we're not here to talk about Swingers. We're here to talk about Goodfellas. You watched it. We watched it a while ago. Mm -hmm. these guys are getting into all sorts of trouble one of their favorite things to do is you know hijack trucks and then sell off the uh the stolen goods and all the truckers are in on the scam and uh you know everybody's getting paid from here to there the cops are getting paid off these guys are just they're running they're running the city they're running the city then you know heroin gets involved cocaine they start dealing drugs this that and the other thing things take a bit of a turn for the worse we've got the uh shine box scene which was one of everybody's favorites. Uh, Dennis Farina yeah. winds up. They're in sort of like a tiki lounge bar. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it's uh, it's Jimmy, Tommy, and Henry chilling out in this tiki lounge bar. Where they hang out quite a bit at first. Yeah, and some other gangster from some other part of town is over there. And it's like, you know, they're all they're all gangsters. They're all sort of in this thing, but he's just from a different crew. You know, they're not exactly best friends. Mm -hmm. And this guy, played by Dennis Farina, he keeps breaking Tommy's balls about how he remembers when Tommy was just a little boy and he was a shoe shine and how he could, you know, shine those shoes so well. Yeah. And he keeps breaking Tommy's balls and breaking Tommy's balls. That was balls. Tommy's in. Yeah. Was he shined all the mobster shoes? That's what it was. Henry yeah. parked cars, Tommy shined shoes. And one after one too many, you know, run home and get your shine box, Tommy snaps beats the heck out of the guy they all start stomping him if i'm not mistaken this is where the this is the legendary scene where while a man is being stomped half to death um scorsese decided to use donovan's atlantis as the soundtrack to this mm. scene which was always one of my favorite songs i don't know about you it's a beautiful song it's a very silly song so now they got a dead guy on their hands they got to go hide the body they take him out they put him in the trunk of the car. Tommy's mom's house, right? They go to Tommy's mom's house first to what? To borrow a knife? Uh, Is that the only reason they went? I think the shovel was that. He's like, I got, I got, I got a to shovel. To get a shovel, and then they also happen to grab the knife. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, she's a beautiful Italian mom. I had a beautiful Italian grandma. One thing's for sure. You walk in that front door, you're sitting down for a feast. Right. I don't care what anybody tells right. you. So they sit down. They have a great big meal. All the while, Dennis Farina is, like, bleeding to death in the trunk of their car. They come out. They got the shovel. 
Jimmy borrows a knife. They stab him to death, make sure the job's finished. Then they drive him out to the woods and bury him somewhere. So I want to I want to interject real quick. Yeah. The stabbing him to death is actually where the movie starts. Yeah? We, yeah, they start, and they're driving in the car, and they hear something in the trunk. Oh, yeah, that's true. And they huh? look at each other. They pull over the car, and they pop the trunk open, and Farina's in there, and they they stab him to death. Yeah. And then, and it, then goes it goes back to young Henry Hill. You're right. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's where that, that like really famous line is, right? Um, All as far life, back I... as I can remember, I've always wanted to be a gangster. Yeah. Like that's, it's like right after that. It's like they do this horrific thing, and then it cuts back to him being a, a kid. Yeah, an innocent little kid just parking cars. And then we catch back up to it, and, that, and that's where yeah. we're at. I think movies that do that, that start in the middle of the story and mm-hmm. then flash back to the beginning, yeah. I think I always forget about the starting in the middle part. Sure. I guess that's a good thing. I don't know. Yeah. you just in for it. That's great. Yeah, maybe that's it. I'm yeah, because if you feel like, it. oh, I had to watch that twice, like, that's a problem. Yeah. Huh. Good call. So good the call, Wes. So, so they kill the guy and bury the body. They sure do. And then, uh, you know, we cut to the next morning. Henry's, like, hosing out the trunk of his car, talking about he hit something gross, and his wife and kids are like oh what's that smell blah 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 everybody's just getting into more and more trouble then the left hansa um what is it the left hansa robbery starts uh getting mentioned now this thing takes like years to plan right i feel like they mention it so early in the movie and they keep teasing that it's about to happen it's about to happen and it feels like years until they finally actually do the left hansa heist yeah there's and, definitely uh, a lot of planning what's that Definitely a lot of planning. A whole lot of planning. And basically, it's like these guys who work security, they know that this certain plane is coming soon that's going to have all this money on it. And they're willing to, you know, turn a blind eye for a percentage and this, that, and the other thing. And what is it? Maury from the the toupee guy is the one who, like, turned them on to this gig. Right? Yeah. And so he's constantly what bugging. he sell, like, like, mattresses or something, Maury? No, he sells toupees, doesn't he? He sells toupees? I thought yeah. he was just the toupee guy. I thought for sure I thought he, he wears a toupee, but I thought he also sold toupees. Or oh, I don't remember. remember he had the commercial where he's like, it doesn't come off, and he jumps in the pool and all that. Oh, yeah, that's true. So he's constantly bugging, and he's always he's always irking the gangsters because he's always trying to hang out like he's one of them just because he's he's got this heist in line that is still, you know, however many months down the road. And so he's just constantly annoying them, like, oh, look at me, I'm one of you guys. And it's like, no, you're not. You're a guy who gave us a good tip, you know, know your place. Maury never learns his lesson. Now, we'll find out how that ends. Now, yeah. I, I got the, um, from what I understand, yeah. the Lufthansa heist is a real heist. Yes. But it was not these guys necessarily that did it. Oh, really? That it was unsolved up well, until 2014. Interesting. And in 2014, they solved it, and, and the peop- most of the people who were still alive yeah. from that heist were, have been arrested. Wow. Yeah, so only two years ago, and I would think that if these guys had actually done it, yeah. they would have been arrested in 1990. <laughs> maybe. But then again, I mean, that's how pow- powerful the mob was, you know, is yeah, that they were still able to keep people off their off their trail. Yeah. Because, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, this movie spills the beans on a whole lot of things, a bunch of murders, mm-hmm. the Lufthansa heist. It's scary, man. It's a scary movie. So you, we're, we're talking to you. If you're a fan of this show, of Euster, you've, you've watched Goodfellas. Yeah. Where does it go? They finally pull off the Lufthansa heist. And they're like, don't spend the money. <clears throat> don't spend any of this money. Meanwhile, Maury is being kind of uh, boxed out of the money. He doesn't right. get paid. He hasn't been paid, and he's constantly bugging for it, constantly bugging for it. And Maury, unfortunately, does not learn a very valuable lesson. That lesson is, when you go into business with mobsters, and you have no muscle of your own, you don't really have a leg to stand on when it comes to bugging people about getting paid. Sadly, Maury never learns that lesson. No. Because he winds up getting stabbed in the back of the neck one day in a car full of mobsters, mm-hmm. and it's tragic. But um, Henny Youngman. Henny Youngman. That's who, was in the, that's who was in the Copa Club, right? Yeah. Henny Youngman. Yeah, Henny that Youngman. sounds correct. And I remember thinking... Man, Henny Youngman was still alive. You bet when he, he was. shot this movie. You bet he was a young man. Ha. Ah. Uh, let's hear it for him. May he rest in peace. Um, see, what's crazy about this movie is it's a wonderful movie. You can sit there and you can just watch it 
and go along for the ride. Yeah. But it's like there are almost so many various little storylines that kind of pop up here and then don't pop up again until way over there. And then, and uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty hard to just try to talk it's through. Easy to get mixed up. It's extremely easy to get let's mixed go, up. Let's go, let's go big broad strokes. Big broad what strokes. What happens to Henry? Let's not even worry too much about the other people. All I right. mean, they, they end up, they do end up icing some of the guys from Luhan's, Lufthansa pretty much everybody. heist because they keep spending money in. Yeah, they all keep you spending know. their stolen money on big extravagant things. New cars and furs. Right. Johnny Roast Beef buys his wife that great big, what, was it a pink Cadillac? It's yeah. a big gaudy car that he bought like the day after the heist. Yeah. Uh, one of the other guys buys his wife like a big expensive fur coat. Mm-hmm. Jimmy's like, take the coat off. Take the coat off now. And he hides it. He's going to keep the coat in like a meat locker or something until all the heat bl- wears off. Um yeah, everybody's just breaking all the rules, spending all this money, drawing all this attention to themselves, um, and things just start going wrong. And so Jimmy essentially starts taking people out if he worries that their actions are going to attract too much uh, attention from law enforcement. When did um, Spider show up? Spider? I feel like he first shows up in the very scene where he winds up getting shot in the foot. He- right? Well, they end up killing him, killing him. Right in that but I, scene, I feel like the first time we see him is in the in the shot. In the but foot. where is that in the movie? I, I don't remember exactly where that is in the movie. How, it's just how sort far of in in there? Yeah, yeah. Michael it's, Imperioli is that his yeah. name? Um, Michael played Imperioli, Christopher, Chrissy, Chrissy Moltisanti, Christopher from The Sopranos. A lot of Sopranos people in this. Almost anybody who was in Sopranos almost was in Goodfellas. Yeah, I think it's safe to say everybody that was in Goodfellas showed up in The Sopranos at one point. That. Maybe not 100% true, but... No. Uh, but, yeah, so Christopher Moltisanti plays this real sweet kid named Spider. I loved Spider. Yeah, and he's sort I of like their, you know, their secret, most intimate poker room sort of bartender. It's yeah. like just the core, absolute core group of these guys. When they hang out to play cards, they hang out in this tiny little room with a bar, and Spider gets them their drinks and whatnot. And so Spider runs afoul of Tommy, Joe Pesci. He gets tired of taking crap. Tired of taking crap from him. And uh, he tells him to go F himself. Yeah. Joe Pesci shoots him in the foot. Yeah. It's terrible. And then he gets hospitalized. He gets his foot worked on. Then he's back at the at the poker room. And now he's limping while he tries to get these guys drink. And uh, what is it? Uh, he's trying to get them drinks. And, and Tommy's like, step on the gas, you know, hurry up over here. And does he tell him to go F himself again? Or what does he tell him? Yeah, I don't remember. I think so. No, I think that is when he tells him to go after himself. Yeah. I think when he gets shot in the foot, it's for a much lesser offense. Yeah. I don't think he is that. I think now is when he says, go after yourself. And Jimmy's like, oh, Spider, look at this. And he's he's like happy for him. I yeah. think he even gives him money like as a tip for standing up for himself. Yeah. And then Joe Pesci decides he's got to murder this teenage boy. It's pretty, pretty sad. Yeah. Um. What I... The reason I bring it up, I, it was one of the scenes I really liked, not just because I like the actor and yeah. um, you you like Spider, but it's I found it interesting because it was the same situation that Tommy goes through with Farina's character. So Farina gets out of jail, yeah, and he's sitting wrong. there and he he starts busting his balls because he's a servant, yeah. And that's essentially what Tommy's doing is he's busting his balls because he's a servant. Right. And and then he, he bites back and then he gets killed for it. Yeah. And so I thought it was interesting that there was no like I guess it kind of shows the um what's the right word? It shows I guess the sort of journey that Tommy DeVito's character goes through. Yeah. In that he he changes and he forgets where he came from. Right. And Whereas he gets the ultimate reminder. Right. Whereas Henry sort of remembers, he sort of stays pretty, um, he stays sort of the same the whole movie. Yeah. He definitely grows and stuff and he definitely changes, but uh, he. I think if anything, he gets dumber. Yeah. Well, he's, he's definitely the same guy. Yeah. At the end of the film that he is kind of at the beginning of the film. Yeah. Whereas Tommy kinda... definitely changes. Yeah. Yeah. Tommy. Like you said, a, a servant who bites back. Well, he bit back against Farina, and then much like him killing Spider for biting back, we go down the road a few years. Tommy has now been invited to to be made right 
the the highest most you know sicilian mobsters in this world guys that we haven't even seen in the movie right are going to make tommy he's got to go he's got to make his bones as they say yep and he's going to be a made man and jimmy and henry are super excited because they're his crew and even though they can never be made the fact that they're going to be with tommy who's made and they're his two best friends it's pretty much as if they themselves are made. There is a realization, though, but when Tommy goes there, though, that Henry has. Yeah. I think he and uh, Jimmy both realize they're, they're, they go and have a conversation about it out in the diner, right? Yeah. And there's sort of an animosity even between these two guys um, because Henry is – he's afraid that Jimmy's going to kill him over the Lufthansa – heist as well oh. right so there's there's sort of like a standoff between the two of them and if you look over um look over he- their heads yeah. i think uh over de niro's head yeah. there's a bullet hole in the window oh wow yeah aiming at him um i thought that was like really like interesting and there's this sort of like impending I vaguely remember this yeah there's like this sort of like impending doom yeah, like it could happen anywhere. Kind yeah, of exactly. And and Henry has become extremely paranoid. Yeah, I mean that this is like a huge step. Like the paranoia between that and the paranoia of the feds and like getting caught with all the drugs and all yeah, that stuff. So many, so much cocaine in this. Movie. <laughs> um, and uh, and I feel like I remember him saying something like, "There's only two things that can happen." Either you're going to get made yeah. or you're going to get killed. Yeah. Scary stuff. What happens to Tommy? Tommy gets killed. Tommy gets killed. He walks into the room with these two older guys and, you know, he's expecting to walk in and there's going to be all the highest ranking uh, mobsters. And, and instead he walks into a completely empty room and I think he even says like, ah, shit or something. And then they just cap him right behind the ear. And that's the end of Tommy DeVito. May he rest in peace. But, uh, yeah, and then, you know, Henry's narration goes on to say this was a long-awaited revenge for taking out Dennis Farina's character because that was a made guy, and you don't just go kill a made guy just because you're angry at him. And that's what Tommy did, and that's what Tommy got, and it's very sad. It's a a sad story. It's it's, I mean, all these guys are just as guilty as the next. But, uh, man, so so let's stick with Henry. He's our, our storyteller here. He winds up just way in over his head, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a scene where Jimmy tries to uh, – he goes to jail for a while, and his wife is sneaking him stuff in the jail. Um, but while she's on the outside, she's, like, virtually alone and penniless, you know? Mm-hmm. And at one point, um, um, after Henry gets out of jail, Jimmy tries to have Karen bumped off. And he's, you know, walking with her through some – shop that he owns or something like that and they walk out to this like really sleazy street and he's like hey i want you to go this place right down the block i want you to go in there get a nice dress tell him i sent you and she gets near the door and they're just you can't tell exactly what's going on inside but you can just see there's a lot of like big dudes through this door and they seem to be working with some sort of very strange heavy sort of equipment that Again, you can't see much of it, but it's safe to assume that if she goes in that door, those guys are ordered to just murder her and probably get rid of her body right there in that room. Maybe there's some sort of weird, I don't know, shrink wrap, garbage compactor machine. I don't know what it could be. So Karen fortunately uses her head and she's just like, no, it's okay. I'll see you later. And she scurries off afraid for her life. Henry, she gets home to Henry. She's like, oh my God, I thought he was going to have me killed, blah, blah, blah. Henry's already neck deep. Um. We soon jump to, uh, he's he's just got all this cocaine. I'm going straight to the end because there's so many little details and this and that. It could take hours to discuss them all. One day, Henry is about where where is he even trying to go that day? No, he's got to take Lois to an airport to smuggle some stuff for him, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lois. Oh boy, we'll get to Lois in a second. <laughs> that whole day. As he's out trying to run all these different errands and, you know, get some coke chopped up over here and collect this and that from over there and get his brother from the hospital and this, that, and the other thing. Played by Kevin Corrigan, by the way. Um, every It's like everywhere he drives, there's this helicopter following him and he spots it real early and they just keep following him and keep following him. I think he manages to switch cars at one point and they're just on him nonstop. And then... <clears throat> 
he gets home and he, he, as he's narrating this, he also keeps talking about how he has to get back and take care of this pot of spaghetti sauce that he's got on the stove. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, you've, you've, it's the craziest paranoia. Like yeah. that whole, it's the whole thing is insane. Right. But also he's, he's, he's given himself so many things that he's got to try to do that day yeah. before he can get Lois to the airport to help him smuggle these drugs. And he's cooked up. And he's super coked up. So finally, he's like, everything is now in place after him running himself ragged and being followed by police helicopters all day. And uh, stupid Lois is just like, well, you got to take me all the way back to my place because I need my lucky hat. And Henry's like, what the heck are you talking about? And Lois, who's just some young girl. I don't know. Is she a family member even? Like, she well, just she, sort of seemed to come in. She's in, in on it, right? She's in yeah, on she, Yeah, I mean, she's helping him smuggle. No, no, no. She's in on him getting caught. Oh, that's probably true. That's why, that's why I thought she went. She wanted to go back for the hat. Was that's, she was buying time. Yeah. For the I cops. Almost, I almost feel like, though, I don't feel like they made that 100% clear. That's, that's the feeling I got, was that she was... But it's likely. That she was... Like an informant for yeah, the cops. Maybe. And that she didn't need the hat, obviously, but she was trying to buy time for the cops to, like, move in and, like, actually know where the drugs were. That might very well be true. And so that was that was what that was all about. Yeah. Yeah. And so frickin' Lois, insisting she have her lucky hat in order to get on this plane, um, you know, Henry's like, fine, get in the car, we'll go get your hat. And as he's backing out of his driveway with Lois in the car... The Popo show yeah, up. Which is the that's why I'm Yeah. The hat. Yeah. It's all about getting them getting them located. Getting them where they want them. Getting them where they want them indeed. But again, not made a hundred percent clear. So maybe Lois really was just this bad luck charm. But maybe she did get herself involved in the uh ratting out of Henry Hill. It's hard to say. Henry Hill gets busted. Mm -hmm. He and his family decide to go into witness protection. And the rest is good, fellas. Yeah. And it's quite a movie. If you're listening to this, you should have watched it. If you haven't watched it, we left out so many details. Yeah, you can go back and watch it. You can absolutely go back and watch it. I first saw this movie when I was a, a kid in elementary school. I've seen it plenty of times since. And every time I watch it, I still pick up more stuff that just didn't quite stick with me the first time. And it's always a pleasurable, although very... It's one of those experiences that makes me think, boy, am I glad I didn't take that road. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, the movie is known for its violence and vulgarity. They sure. drop the F-bomb a lot in the movie. A whole lot. Like over 300 times I read. Like I, I think it, wow. I think they average uh, an F-word uh, once every two minutes. Wow. it's a lot of Fs. But it really wasn't that violent like they talk about a lot of stuff and there it definitely is violence yeah but it um the runtime like if you look at the ratio of violence to runtime yeah. it's not that bad i mean i feel like i've seen a lot worse i think maybe the idea is just that when there is violence it's, it's like it's intense. very savage very brutal yeah no caller id oh some somebody's phone's ringing um the mpaa made them remove 10 frames Ten frames. Not even a not even a not even a half a second of footage of blood to give them an R rating. Not even a half a second of footage. Wow. To give them an R rating. That where was this blood? Did it I don't say? Know. Just just overall. Uh, you got wild. a little too much blood. I think sometimes though ten frames of blood. I think sometimes though they they just resubmit stuff. Like there's that famous South Park story, the South Park uh, bigger, longer, uncut. Yeah. They just um, every time they got a note from the MPA that said no, you can't. Uh, you got to make it less vulgar. They would add more vulgarity to it and resubmit it, and eventually they were like, oh yeah, it's good now. Wow. And this is kind of arbitrary, but ten frames in order to get an R rating. Terrifying. Yep. So there was that much blood in it. Should we go through some trivia? Sure. All right. First piece of trivia listed on IMDb. Uh, this movie, in case you aren't aware, is uh, contains the notorious uh, You Think I'm Funny scene where Henry and Tommy and some of the other guys are all sitting around a table telling stories, making each other laugh. Tommy's telling a funny story, and Henry says uh, 
Henry's laughing and he's like, you're funny, Tommy. And Tommy gives him the old, you think I'm funny? How am I funny? Funny how? Funny how? Am I a clown to you? So the you think I'm funny scene Mm -hmm. was based on a story that Joe Pesci acted out for Martin Scorsese. While working in a restaurant as a young man, Pesci once told a mobster that he was funny and the mobster became very angry. Scorsese allowed Pesci and Ray Liotta to improvise the scene. He did not tell the other actors in the scene what would happen because he wanted their genuine surprise reactions. That's yeah, you great. definitely get that feeling. Absolutely. And it's interesting because we talked about it in Home Alone. Yeah. Uh, was it Chris Columbus was like, do that do that scene for me. Oh, yeah? And, and so Pesci was doing the I'm funny how scene. Yeah. We talked about that on our podcast. Look, man. You don't remember that far back. That was like at least two episodes ago. At least two episodes ago. Probably six. No, probably four. Yeah. I don't know how many episodes ago. I'll listen to it. See, I don't have to remember it because I can just listen to it all over again. Nice. Home Alone with Joe Pesci. Here we go. Uh, Let me see. Do you have a favorite piece of trivia? Do I have a favorite piece? Let me look at their trivia. All Um, right. I'm going to... I'm not sure. Mention one while you look. Here's one. In a documentary from 2006 entitled The Real Goodfella which aired in the United Kingdom, Henry Hill, real-life gangster Henry Hill, claimed that Robert De Niro would call him seven to eight times a day to discuss certain things about De Niro's character, Jimmy, Hmm. such as how Jimmy would hold his cigarette, etc. Oh. Robert De Niro, eight, seven or eight phone calls a day, Probably get sick of Robert De Niro after a while. Well, I wonder, does that guy really have that kind of time on his hands? Yeah. Hey, hey, Wes and Steve, how are you guys? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to clear something up. It's I, me. I can't tell if that's De Niro or uh, it's me. It's... Uh, you can't tell by looking at me that I'm uh, Robert De Niro. Listen, Henry L said I would call him seven or eight times a day to ask about a cigarette. That's false. I called <laughs> six to seven times a day. So I'm Robert De Niro. Thanks. It's almost. It was almost a walk-in. <laughs> It's something. That's all. That's about all I can tell you. So uh, you asked me to look at some trivia. Yes. My The trivia I like is, you know, I was talking about, it's not that violent. The body count in this is only 10. Wow. Only 10? 10. That seems low for this movie. Only 10. Wow. Yeah, maybe it's just because of how, like, horrific yeah. these moments are. You know, like Johnny Rose Beef and his wife in the front of their car. Yeah, I mean, like, some wow. of it's, like, real sudden. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like um, he kill when he kills Spider. It yeah. feels real sudden. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe it's just about the horror factor. Uh, when Tommy dies, like you, you know that there's something, some doom coming, but it just like happens. You know, right? Very true. Very true. Sorry, I took a drink of my uh, my tea there. That's quite all right. I was reading something uh, silently. Wow, Ray Liotta, mm. who played Henry Hill. Mm-hmm. Don't look, don't look. Okay. Ray Liotta turned down this role in 1989 in order to make good films. I know this one. You do? I do know this one. So what is it? He turned down Harvey Dent in Batman. In Tim Burton's and Batman. And Billy D. Williams played him instead. Pretty awesome. And then Tommy Lee Jones. Could you imagine Ray Liotta in that one scene where Harvey Dent shows up? Yeah, right. I don't know if it would have been as legendary. I think I would have gone Goodfellas as well. It makes me kind of think that originally Harvey Dent had a bigger part in Batman. Yeah, you may be onto something. But then again, Ray Liotta wasn't that big of a star back then. That's true. You know, I don't know if I've ever seen Ray Liotta before Goodfellas. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I've seen something from well, before see, Goodfellas. I'll, I'll take a look at Ray Liotta. years since, but I can't remember ever seeing anything with Ray Liotta in it and then watching Goodfellas and going, oh, there's Ray Liotta. He ran into me once. Cool. Like, like he almost knocked me over. Wow. And I tried to say something to him. He just ignored me and uh, kept walking. Whoa. I think you got off light. I after, guess. After watching Goodfellas and uh, Heartbreakers, I'd say you got off light. Yeah, whatever. You remember him in Heartbreakers? No. Yeah, he uh, plays one of the guys that Jennifer Love Hewitt and Sigourney Weaver are conning. I have not seen Heartbreakers. Oh, well, you're not missing a lot. But there's a scene where uh, this guy's dead and... He runs into them while they're trying to hide the body, and they're just like, you know, you idiot, like, blah, blah, blah. And he's mad at them because they've conned him and this and that. And then um, he's like, fine, I'll help you hide the body. And then, uh, you know, they start arguing about something else, and Sigourney Weaver's like, are you going to help us or not? 
And he's like, yeah, I said I'll help you. Wait, what did he say? He goes, I said I'd help you, didn't I? And she goes, oh, do you, re- do you really know anything about hiding a body? And he goes, I'm from Jersey, aren't I? And I always thought that was a pretty funny one. Do Not, you, yes, I've hidden a body before or anything. Just, I'm from Jersey, aren't I? Do you remember uh, Casablanca when we watched that? Not that yeah. long ago. Do you remember Sasha, the bartender? Sasha, the bartender. Yeah, vaguely, yeah. And he wanted to take the girl home. Right. And he's like, come right back. Yeah. Uh, Ray Liotta played Sasha in a 1983 short-lived television series called Casablanca that was wow. a prequel to the film. Wow. Five episodes. That's pretty wild. A view the right thing, full circle moment. Did a lot of TV. Field of Dreams, something wild. And then, you know, Goodfellas would be the next big thing. Dominic and Eugene. That's a good one. Dominic and Eugene. Dominic and Eugene. That's the one about the brothers, right? Sounds correct. There's so much trivia in this movie. Dominic and Eugene is like a uh, modern, more well, it was the 80s, but a more modern day of Mice and Men, which, by the way, is my favorite book. Of Mice and Men? Of Mice and Men. It's a pretty good book. It's very sad. Yeah. I want you to look over there. Here's a piece of trivia that our costuming fans mm. will uh, appreciate. Every one of Robert De Niro's suits mm-hmm. had a watch and a pinky ring to go with it. Wow. That's a lot of watches and pinky yeah, rings. Yeah, it is. Well, I, re- I uh, had read that um kind of along with costuming that uh maybe maybe it falls into props but Lorraine Bracco's jewelry yeah uh when she's when she's standing at the dresser and she's got like a big jewelry box full of jewelry yeah all she demanded that it all be real very expensive jewel, jewelry oh yeah and so uh she got her wish and there was an armed guard on set for the for when they were using it wow yeah had to have that really expensive jewelry do you want to talk about debbie mazar at all i suppose i mean she's I don't know. debbie mazar it's kind of weird know. she she played she shows up in this movie she played leota's like second or third mistress and wound up getting him into a lot of trouble with yep. all the cocaine and they both really love cocaine and sex yep. she almost got him killed by his wife yeah Wait, was that her or was that the first mistress? No, it I think was it was her. her. Yeah. It was her. Yeah, one night, you know, Karen comes sneaking into. She was the friend of the second, of the first mistress. That's what it was. Is and it... hadn't she also been somebody else's mistress? She was one Maybe. of the other guy's mistresses, too. And, Maybe Tommy and or somebody. started uh, getting fresh with her. Here's a fun one. Uh, it is claimed that the real life Jimmy was so happy to have Robert De Niro play him in this movie that he telephoned De Niro from prison to give him a few pointers on how to play Jimmy. Uh, author screenwriter Nicholas Pileggi denies this claim, saying De Niro and Jimmy had never spoken, but admitting that there were men around the set all the time who had known all of the principal characters hmm. very well. That doesn't surprise me. It's kind of scary. Yeah. I think it's probably good for Goodfellas. Sure. Stuff. Sure. We talked about the movie. Did you like it uh, having seen it multiple oh, yeah. times? Yeah. I, uh, I mean, it's Goodfellas, man. This movie holds up like nobody's business. I liked it. I wouldn't rush out to see it again. No. Um, some of these, But you don't have to rush out. You can watch it from the comfort of your own home. It's true. Some of these... Um, 26 years old. Slower uh, period gangstery things yeah. don't, don't hold my interest that well this did a pretty good job i you know it's yeah. interesting i had to k- keep reminding myself like of the importance of this film yeah because i kind of i kind of like I, i'm i didn't date like doze off or anything all right but i would kind of i think i kind of like you know when you're driving and then you're not like fully there. Yeah. It's not like you're sleeping. Yeah. You just kind of go into the zone. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of just went into the zone on this film. Wow. And, and I think it's because I have seen so much of this in other films. Yeah. And it's kind of like been there, seen it. Hmm. Um, but then I'd have to remind myself that I'd seen it because right. this film set that bar. Right. You know, this film did it first. So that um, happened to me in a real life situation. Not, too long with some ago. gangsters no uh fortunately it was with a stand-up comedian do you know who um now i'm blanking on his name cool oh my gosh i'll tell that story in a moment after i look up his name 
I can't believe okay. this. Okay, uh, no problem. But yeah, I can understand that getting into the zone thing. Because like just now, I mean, I've seen the movie so many times and I was still only able to pull this much of it out of my right. memory, you know? Right. Because there's just so much to it. Yeah. I, so much. And if we'd recorded this right after we had watched it, it would have been a little bit easier. But Right. It's been a while since we watched it. Over a month. Over a month. Gosh, has it really? It has really I still been feel like I just got back from from like Christmas vacation. And yeah, it, it does feel like April that. Something. Well, we haven't seen each other much since. That's true. It's been a while. We haven't been to Disneyland in a while. It's been a long while. Oh, man. Why can't I find this guy's name? This is going to drive me crazy. Keep vamping, Wes. Keep uh, vamping. I'm vamping, vamping. Uh, what do I say now? But yes, we were talking about how you were in the zone watching this movie, and yeah. it's not that you were asleep. But I, did, that... I did like it. You know, it just was that, I said it already, it was just that, you know, I'd seen this from other movies already. Mm. Um, and I, like I said, I had to remind myself that this is the one that sort of set that bar and, you know, give credit where credit's due. I, uh, but I liked the movie. I thought it was, I thought it was fun. I liked, uh, Tommy DeVito a lot. Yeah. Tommy's a legendary character, man. Like, all, you know, again, often, imp- often, imp- puppet, often, Oompa often imitated, yeah. never duplicated. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, Joe Pesci. What was the last thing we saw him in? The good American? No. The Pesci? movie? Yeah, what was the last thing we saw Pesci? I, I last it was thing. that movie where Matt Damon was at Yale, and it was sort of about like the founding of the CIA. Was it he like a, a homeless guy in that or something? No, he was like some really powerful, like secretive government character. Um, mm-hmm. What was that called? It wasn't the good American. It wasn't the good German. What the heck was that movie called? I have no idea. But what yeah, it had Matt Damon. The Good Shepherd? The Good Shepherd. I have not seen it. Um, I don't. He hasn't done a ton. Entirely know if I can recommend it. Do you want to guess how many movies he's done? Joe Pesci has been in two movies, more than two. <laughs> you know he was in Home Alone and Home Alone Two. He was in the both Home Alones. We know he was in the Good Shepherd, Gone Fishing, Gone Fishing, very, which a man very, died very for important. Gone Fishing. Oh, really? that's sad. Did you know that? No. Yeah, there's some sort of stunt scene going on with a boat, a, a fishing boat crash. Yeah, and somebody died. Not good. To make Gone Fish. That's not your the legacy you want. Not at all. So. I almost wonder if that might have been what put him off movies for a while. He was in at least three lethal weapons. Mm-hmm. Two, three, and four. Mm-hmm. Just pick a number. Nine. Nine? You think he's only been in nine movies? Thirteen. Thirty-nine. Thirty-nine, okay. But I, you know, when you look at, like, yeah. Leota. Yeah. He's been in like 107. A whole lot. No yeah. Escape. Oh, yeah. Do you remember No Escape? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was an intense movie. So you didn't remember the comedian's name. That's okay. Warren Hutcherson. Warren Hutcherson. I kept wanting to say Harlan something. And, and I'm like, no, that's not right. And how was, how was this a similar situation? So Warren Hutcherson, he's been a stand-up comedian and a, a writer on a whole lot of really funny stuff. Yep. And I grew up watching stand-up com- com- comedy. Stand up comedy. Yeah, we're both having a hard time speaking tonight. It's all right, man. It's Saturday afternoon, baby. Relax. Yeah. Obama's in town. It's raining. Relax, dude. <laughs> I grew up watching a lot of stand up comedy. Among those stand ups was Warren Hutcherson. And he has this joke about, uh, you know, I remember being a young man. Uh, he's a black gentleman. And he talks about, I remember being a young man and going grocery shopping with my dad. And my dad would show me how, look at the injustice here, son. The green olives get to be in a jar. They get to sit in their jar and look out on the store and see everybody that passes by. But the black olives have to be in a can. It's true. And he's like, you think about that, son. And he makes some comment like racism's everywhere or something like that. So years and years later, Warren Hutcherson is doing a, uh, a guest speaker engagement at my acting class. And our teacher is like, could you do maybe just like five minutes? Like, let us just hear some of like your favorite jokes. Mm-hmm. And he tells that story. And... I'd been a fan of this guy for so long that it was like, he's Warren Hutcherson. He's not that guy who tells that joke. He's right. Warren Hutcherson. Right. I love him to pieces. He's, he's, you know, he's great. I respect him thoroughly. And he starts in on that joke. And at first my brain goes, oh, I've heard this joke so many times, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, but wait a minute, moron. The guy. The, the guy, guy is telling it. The guy yeah. that you heard this joke from is in this room telling you this joke, and that is a magical Hollywood moment is what that is. I had that happen um, 
I went and saw E.T. at the Hollywood Bowl. Oh, yeah. I talked I about that once or twice. yesterday on Netflix. <sighs> Why'd you watch E.T. without me? I just put it on in the background uh, while I worked. Always watch it with me. I, I watch mean, that movie over and over and over. You, you know me. I don't watch movies over and over again. You know, know. that. So I'm saying that's the one. But, I understand. Yeah, oh, it's a soccer game. Yeah, okay. there's some coyotes outside. I thought so, a man was being ripped to shreds. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is Burbank. Oh, uh, boy. Uh, so I we went and saw... E.T. at the Hollywood Bowl, and they did all of the music, the or- the orchestra live. Oh. And there are times when I had to remind myself we were listening to a live orchestra. Yeah. Because you just get so sucked into it, and, and the, the music does its job. It, like, it's very evocative. It's yeah. very emotional, but at the same time, it, like, just is a part of the movie. Yeah. Whether it's live or not. And there's, there's a couple moments where, like, you couldn't help but, like, feel... You know, like the flying scene, the first time they fly. Oh, sure. Um, that moment with a live orchestra was incredible. That sounds incredible. Gave me chills. E.T. with a live orchestra. That sounds nice. You know. Uh, sounds like a nice night. We have. Um, yeah. We have a couple of Hollywood Bowl events coming up this, this summer. Oh, yeah. That sound pretty exciting. One is uh, A Night at the Movies, which is just different movie Music. All right. But John Williams is coming back. I feel like that happens every summer. It didn't happen last year. It didn't? Nope. Nope. He didn't do uh, E.T. or the... Somebody else did A Night of John Williams. Okay. Um, he is going to do the music from Star Wars The Force Awakens. Whoa. Yeah. It's only the second half. Here's the first half is a different, different conductor. Here's something I want you to think about for a moment. And yes. you viewsters listening at home. Also think about this. Star Wars The Force Awakens, right? Yep. I've heard of it. Premiered like right before Christmas last year. Mm -hmm. And I seem to be the only one who notices this. And maybe I've mentioned this to you before. Mm -hmm. But did you feel like when the character Rey is introduced and we hear her theme, did you feel like her theme was very Christmassy? I don't think I did, no. I sure did. I'll have to watch it again. And then on top of that, in her scene... She goes sledding. She gets on a sled and she sleds down a maybe, hill. Maybe it was intentional. In a movie released right before Christmas. I feel like they were putting just a little bit of Christmas it's into possible. the movie right at that moment. It's possible. And he, what else does she do? She takes a sack full of goodies <laughs> yeah. to a guy. Yeah. Whatever whatever Ungar plot is, whatever kind of guy he is. Yeah. She takes him a sack full of goodies after going sledding. And then her theme's got that Christmassy feel to it. I have the the Blu-ray up there on the oh, shelf. Oh, Haven't even opened snap. it yet. Haven't even opened it yet. You know what Star Wars The Force Awakens is? A movie. A movie we've seen. Should we talk about other movies we've seen sure. while on our long hiatus? Nice segue. Thank you very much. They call me Steve. Why don't you go first? Because you probably have segways. seen way more movies than I have. All right. I guess I'll maybe work. Sort of backwards, because, you okay. know, most recent memory is definitely the clearest. Okay. Um, I recently, uh, literally like two or three nights ago, I went to Everybody Wants Some. I want to see that. The new Richard Linkletter movie. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. I think that it's impossible for it to be as good as Dazed and Confused ever was. If one I still enjoyed it quite a lot. didn't like Dazed and Confused that much, mm-hmm. do you think one would not like this? Or do you think it's different enough that... It's hard to say. Hard to say. Um, without giving away any spoilers, uh, I'll I'll tell you this. So, Days and Confused is a, is like literally the, I mean, the definition of a slice of life movie. Yeah. It starts on one day, it ends basically on that. I mean, it goes all through that day and overnight through the party and all that, and it ends the very next morning. Yep. It is a slice of life. It follows. A few different characters, some of them only for moments, some of them it follows them all the way through. But, like, that is a slice of life movie if there ever was one. Sure. Um, This movie kind of takes place over, like, I think it starts on a Thursday and ends, like, Monday morning. And, you know, so it's sort of a few hours from this day, a few hours from that day, a few. So it's not exactly a slice of life, you know what I mean? Right. And. So I feel like in that, that helps to set it apart from Dazed and Confused. Um, One thing that kind of not so much turned me off from the movie, but this that just sort of, you know, kept it from reaching the same 
excuse me, I'm suppressing a burp, kept it from reaching the same sort of place in my heart as Dazed and Confused. Um, in case you are unaware, these two movies are both directed by the same guy, Richard Linkletter. He's great. So, Days and Confused starts off, it's a movie, starts in the middle of the day, well, in the morning, frankly, on a Friday at school. It's like the last day of school for all these kids. We follow some eighth graders, we follow some uh, juniors who are about to come become seniors, and it's basically a movie that, like, establishes, like, this is what life was like for, you know, basically white kids in this very rural slash suburban part of Texas mm-hmm. in 1976, mm-hmm. and it's like... You know, these eighth grade kids are about to be high school freshmen. These high school juniors are about to be high school seniors. So the juniors are kind of establishing the pecking order for the upcoming freshmen, yep. letting them know like, hey, you're about to be in our high school. We're going to chase you around town. We're going to paddle you. We're going to put you through all these weird little hazing rituals. And like, guess what? Be a good sport about it. We'll get you some beers at the end of the night. We'll teach you something about, you know, how to chase girls and how to, you know, be cool. And, you know, just play along. And then when you're juniors, you'll get to do it to the incoming freshmen, right? It's sort of a really rite of passage kind of movie. It's very well done. How do yeah. you feel about Days Confused? I'm not a big fan. Not a big fan. Okay. But I haven't seen this since I was a kid. That might be detrimental, frankly, because I first saw Days Confused when I was an eighth grader. Saw it in the theaters at midnight showings. I probably went six times. I loved that movie. Yeah, but you were you were like you had a bunch of buddies that got up to no good. Exactly. Right. And whereas I didn't, so I feel like maybe I might as more of a like I was a movie nut back yeah. then, but I wasn't like a film nut. You know what I mean? I like understand. I didn't appreciate film. I might appreciate the movie more as an adult. I hope that you will, because I'd love to watch it again, and maybe, maybe we should watch it together. Maybe we could add it in the bucket. But here's what's up. So since Dazed and Confused, I mean, we're talking that's a movie 23 years old already. Right. Since that movie, many other movies have come along trying to do what Dazed and Confused did. Uh, a timely example of that is uh, Empire Records, which everybody's posting all about because it was recently Rex Manning Day. Didn't like that movie either. I don't care for Empire Records either. The only people I know that like it are girls. And all the dudes that I know that like it are the same type of dudes that would like Dave Matthews Band because they just like whatever girls <laughs> like in hopes that they get to sleep with I know, those girls. I know there. I said it. I know dudes that are not like that, like Empire Records. Um, I'm glad that you but do. But they're they're also like not really hipster. Okay. But they definitely like they're definitely music aficionados who think they're cooler than the others. Okay. And don't mind telling you that your music sucks. Sure. I'm a, a bit of one of those guys, but I still don't like Empire yeah. Records very much. Now, granted, I've only really watched it one time through, and I remember going, I don't need to watch this again, you, so I haven't. You are too cool for school, but you don't act like you're too, too right. cool for school. I, I try not to. I try not to. And thank you for that compliment, sir. So, back to Everybody Wants Some. It's kind of impossible for Everybody Wants Some to do what Dazed and Confused did. Right. Because so many movies came along trying to do what Dazed and Confused did that now, all these years later, even though it's the same writer, it's the same director, it's Richard Linkletter. He's the most perfect guy to capture this kind of a spirit in a movie. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of like, uh, we've kind of seen this. Discount Dazed and Confused. A little. Because it's like, well, we saw Dazed and Confused do this so well, and we've seen all these other movies try to do it, and now it's like... I'm kind of tired of this stuff. And it's almost a little like preachy at times, but Mm -hmm. preachy in like a, in like, you know, not, not a religiously preachy, but there's just some moments where much like his, um, um, fast food nation where it's like, there are these moments that come where it's just one character being like, nah, man, you really got to like do this and be this way and blah, blah, blah. And you know, and that's like, what'll help you like get along in life. And like, that's all cool. And it's fine, and it worked very well when it happened in Dates and Confused. But now, as a guy in his mid-30s seeing that in a movie, it's just sort of like, eh, knock it off. So maybe if yeah. I were a college freshman right now seeing this movie, I would probably love it. I do like the kid that's in it. Uh, Which kid? There's a bunch of uh, The Jenner kid. Um, Blake Jenner? Blake Jenner. I like that kid. Seems all right. He was I on Glee. Was he on Glee? I yeah. never watched Glee. Yeah, for like a season Glee. or two. But yeah, he does a fine job, and everybody, everybody, everybody does. Mm-hmm. Everybody does a fine job. It's a totally fun movie, and but part of me is like, you know, if if I could have seen this when I was just about to go into college, I would yeah. probably totally love it instead of just mostly love it. Sure, um, but it's fun, and I'll watch it with you because I do okay. enjoy it. And I think much like Days and Confused, 
it's going to be one of those movies that just kind of gets a little better each time. I think it's already not in the theater over here now. Um, Everybody wants some. I haven't been able to find it in the Valley. I had to go all the way to the Landmark in like Santa Monica to watch it. It played at the AMC. Oh, really? Yeah, I remember seeing it, it on the list, but um, I went and saw a different movie instead, and we can talk about that in a minute, but... Um, but yeah, it's not up. It's not at the AMC or anything anymore. Yeah. So uh, maybe when it comes out on video, you and I could do a double feature of Days and Confused, and, and everybody, everybody wants some. Wants some, and then really compare. I them. want some too. Okay, that's the song it's named after. Oh, yeah, yeah, Van Halen, baby. Mm-hmm. What movie did you see? I saw actually yesterday. Yeah, I saw Midnight Special. Ooh, and. I really liked it. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm predisposed because I'm a Spielberg guy. Okay. And so maybe I'm um, a little predisposed. It's very... Does Spielberg have his hand in this movie? No, but it's it's very... It's got a very strong Close Encounters of oh, the Third Kind feel. Oh, that's cool. It's, um, it's a really cool like drama about um, s- something bigger than ourselves. All right, and um, it's and it's pretty big. It's very, it's very much about being a parent. Oh yeah, and not that I'm a parent, but uh, I have parents. Yeah, and uh, hi mom, and so um, <laughs> it's uh, it's a very like it's it's very sweet. It's sad at moments. It's mm. very exciting at other moments. It's definitely a drama. It's not like a high impact action popcorn film or anything like that sure. but it's got its moments but uh it's it's really really beautiful it's a really All beautiful right. film midnight special yeah it was uh directed written and directed by jeff nichols all right um who uh you might know from mud or take shelter oh, i still have not finished both of those movies mud is excellent that's what i keep hearing and i just yeah. keep not finishing it mud is really really good and i hear take shelter is also really good yeah and i keep not finishing it it's i got, got a it's got um michael shannon yeah who i like a lot general zod Gen- well i prefer him from like something like the ice man or something the ice man kirsten dunst who i'm not a big fan of but she was fine in this kirsten dunst absolutely blew me away in fargo season two i i, I watched a couple of season one a couple of episodes i'm i'm not that's not my kind of story but i'm gonna keep trying to get through um, season one I would almost say you could just skip to season two because it's a 30 year prequel. Oh, really? And there's really kind of only one character that's in both seasons. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 30 year prequel and Kirsten Dunst is like, I've never seen her this good. Mm. I've never thought she was all that bad, but I've never seen her this good. And like, I just love her character so much. Fargo season two, frankly, Fargo season one as well, but season two is just so dynamite. It's such a, it's so much more of like a thrill ride than season one was. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Midnight special thumbs up. Thumbs Wait, up. Are we allowed to do thumbs up? No, nah, we're not going to do that. But the, um, I want to talk about a couple other actors in it. Yeah. Let's hear it. Um, the kid in it, Jaden, Jaden Smith, Lieber, her, her, Jaden Lieberhart, Lieber, her, Lieber, her, spell Lieber, her. L I E. B E R H E R Lieberher. Lieberher sounds right. Um, he was the kid in St. Vincent. I still didn't watch that. Great. Also great. Oh. He is phenomenal in Midnight Special. Really? He, yeah, he's um, he's not, he's the focus. He's the thing that drives the film. Yeah. But, you know, the main characters are really um, Michael Shannon and Joel Edgerton. Joel Edgerton. All who, right. Who I, I, for some reason... I'm always like, do I like this guy? But every time I watch him in something, I'm like, I like this guy. Hmm. Yeah, Joel Edgerton's fine. He's great. Um, and then uh, Mr. Adam Driver yes. is also in this film. Yes. And I read that uh, he the, the first day of filming on Midnight Special was the day he found out he got uh, Star Wars. I'm sorry, what? The, the first day of filming on I Midnight Special was the first day. It was the day he found out he got the Star Wars role. What is a, what is a Star Wars? You know the Star Wars. <laughs> uh, and there, that is so intense, and, man. And there is a phrase he utters in the film in Midnight Special that I have to think is a reference to the fact that he got Star Wars Ooh. and was excited about it. But I'm not going to say what that for. It's actually something very, very missable. It's not really a spoiler or anything. Okay. Uh, should I just say what it is? No, nah, maybe don't. Nah, don't. Okay. Go see Midnight Special. Go see Midnight Special. Listen. It's really... I want to see it. Really sweet. Yeah. 
Lovely film. Man, I wish I could have seen that with you guys yesterday. Yeah. Um, Do you want to hear about the movie that I didn't, I did that I saw instead of Everybody Wants Some? Sure. Because I think you've seen it. We can both talk about it. Okay. I chose to see Batman versus Superman instead. Oh yes. And I feel like this has been such a divisive film that we should we should address it. If we both see, have you seen it, right? Yeah. Um, I have. I'll say this. Um, in the words of one of my heroes, me is it me? No. Oh, okay. But uh, in the words of my hero, Tom Sharpling of The Best Show, mm-hmm. uh, listen at bestshow.net. Um, as Tom often says, make mine Marvel, son. And I agree, because I definitely, when I grew up and when I was real heavy into comic books, I was way more into Marvel. I really love the X-Men. I really love Captain America. I just really loved all their characters a lot more than any of the DC characters. Now, yes, I was a young boy. I went through my Batman phase. I went through my loving Superman phase. I care about those guys, but I just don't care about them as much as I do the Marvel Universe. So let's let's address that first. Okay. Generally, I'm a Marvel Generally. guy. M- most of the most of the comics that I own are Marvel comics. Sure. I'm a huge but Spider-Man you fan. Love Batman. I do love Batman a lot. Right. And I will say this: as much as I think that um, Marvel's doing it right, yeah, they they really understand the source material and they um, they've created a system and a plan that's really just worked. Right. I don't think any of the Marvel films touches the Dark Knight. Maybe the Avengers, the first Avengers film. Interesting. Um, I think the Dark Knight is probably the greatest superhero film made. It's up there. It's really solid from beginning well, to end. We've had two Captain America movies since then. I, I you know, friend. Winter Soldier is really great. Um, Winter I, Soldier is really. Great. I think it's better than the first Avenger, Captain America: The First Avenger. A little bit, but that movie's so damn fun. It's and wonderful really, and it's really great. But Haley Atwell. I think I still think the uh, first Avengers film as a whole is probably better than Winter Soldier. Yeah, um, this is my opinion. Sure. Um, and I and I, seriously, I think. Um, the performances and the execution of the Dark Knight, yeah. from the music to Heath Ledger, um, uh, what's his name? Harvey Dent, um, uh, uh, Eckhart, Aaron Eckhart. Everybody is just on point in that film. It's pretty great. My chief complaint about the Dark Knight mm. is that it's a little too long. Okay, I will. I'll, I'll, let me backpedal for a minute. Okay, I got to see I The that. Dark Knight a week before it opened Yep, in IMAX in a pretty awesome seat. And when that movie ended, I remember thinking, this might be the greatest movie I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I, I remember being really excited for it. I actually went to the press screening in Seattle for it. I love it. And at IMAX. Nice. And I remember it ending and thinking something really really similar thinking like this changed superhero films i love it before that for my money the absolute best comic book movie so far had been x-men 2 x-men united it's a pretty good one Uh, that's still very high on my list i'm partial to the first one but that's a pretty good one i gotta say two is a little better but two wouldn't exist without one one's very fun yeah yeah two is much more savage yeah anyway the dark knight i love it Mm. however i feel like when it gets towards the end and Batman's got the sonar eye things, mm-hmm. and he's working his way up through that building. And it's like we already had the chase through the tunnel and the capturing of the Joker and all that stuff. Like when it, when it's finally in that final game of cat and mouse sort of thing going on, I'm just like it. It's a little too video gamey for me at that okay. point, and I'm like I could do without this. Except it was very prescient for cuz shortly after that yeah we had all the NSA phone call stuff yeah true very true and then it also got us to the real final showdown we're talking Batman Joker and Harvey Dent right so it did get us to that moment and it was after that moment when the movie's ending and you know he's a uh, you know our 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 watcher in the dark our blah 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 a dark night yeah. Like that's when I was like, this might have been the greatest movie I've ever seen. Yeah. I've cooled on that opinion a little, but I still love it. However, it's pretty solid. So many, almost all of the great Marvel movies have come after that. Sure. I mean, Iron Man one was shortly after Absolutely. that, right? Yeah. And it's like they've all just overshadowed 
everything DC for me. Everything's insane. I, you know, and I still enjoy the DC movies. Yeah. I enjoyed. We should Batman compare and Superman. We should sit down and compare, like, the Dark Knight to yeah. uh, the Winter Soldier. But we're completely off. We're way off. But that's Batman part of being movie buffs. So v, we get to talk about yeah. whatever we want anytime we want. Batman v our show. Superman. Yeah. Um, Can I give you my short review of it? Yeah. I went in with low expectations. Yeah. I enjoyed the ride. I enjoyed the ride mm-hmm. of the movie. Just like, okay, let's see what happens. Cool. I'm entertained. I'm enjoying it. You know, hey, there's Gal Gadot. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I'm enjoying this ride. And then when it was over, I was like, that was a fun way to spend six bucks. There's plenty to complain about. Mm-hmm. From a plot standpoint, from a, you know, a, a, a true to the characters standpoint. Yep. But I enjoyed the ride. So it's like if somebody's going to come to me and be like, hey, should I spend, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, up yeah. to seventeen dollars to go see this movie? And be like, yeah, go ahead. It's like it's a blast. Keep your expectations low. My expectations were pretty low. Yeah. I did not love this film. No, um, I, I, didn't say I love it. I said I enjoyed the ride. Th- I know. I'm just telling you my my take now. I uh, I enjoyed some moments of the ride. Yeah, but it's kind of like a real ride, like a real uh, like ride through the mountains. Like you're driving through the mountains. Yeah, there are some moments that are really great, but there's a lot of moments that you're just kind of bored out of your mind. And I was bored out of my mind several moments of this film. Yeah, um, out yeah. Of your mind. I just was like my. I was thinking about out of your mind. I, w- I was thinking about other things. Yeah. Um, and w- if I wasn't doing that, there were two other things that were happening. I was thinking about why the scene doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> or then I was, then there were the moments where I was like, okay, this is fun. Yeah. Um, I don't like the portrayal of Lex Luthor in this film. I don't, I, I don't need Lex Luthor to be a Batman villain. I felt like, I don't know if it was Eisenberg himself or if maybe Snyder told him. But my official word on that is simply Lex Joker. Yeah, he's very, very Joker-like. The painting and he's all that stuff. He's wearing a long coat. He's yeah. got long, stringy hair. It yeah. almost felt like they were trying to be like, hey, uh, pretend you're a guy who's about to become Heath Ledger's Joker. Right. Action. Yeah. Um, I like Henry Cavill less and less. Oh. I, I just I think he's just so boring as Superman. Superman, like can already be viewed as sort of a boring superhero, right? He's a Boy sure. Scout, right? They, they go on at length about it in Kill Bill Volume 2. But Henry Cavill's portrayal of him hmm. is not interesting. And as Clark, like, I feel like it's hard to compare him to, like, Christopher Reeve, but there's something so likable about Christopher Reeve as Clark. Yeah. And then he makes that transition to Superman. Yeah. He's, like, even more likable. Yeah. But and, also remember, we were babies when Christopher Reeve Yeah, but even that, I, I don't know. You could, I guess, argue that nostalgia colors it. I, 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 think, just, it, I think it has to. Maybe. We're talking about maybe. we were babies when those movies were out. There's something, like, great about bumbling Clark Kent, and you don't get that at all in these films. Very true. And... There's nothing like that's part of what endears people to Superman is that he goes out of his way to be a normal guy. Right. You know, yeah, to be to the be Clark the Kent underdog. Costume. Yeah. And that's the thing is like you always want an underdog. And like with Superman, that he's never really the underdog. Mm. And he he forces himself to become the underdog. And I think that's what people like really like like about him. Yeah. Um, and you don't get that at all with Henry Cavill. And so it's just the same thing from beginning to end. And it's just kind of boring. I can understand that. Um, I don't like as I think Ben Affleck is fantastic in this film. Actually, I like yeah. I like a lot of the performances. I like Jesse Eisenberg's performance if he wasn't Lex Luthor. Sure. Um, ben Affleck is Batman. I love it. Yeah. I hate that he kills indiscriminately in this film. I a little bit of that. I felt like he's extremely uh, un Batman like yeah. in the film in a lot of ways, um, branding people specifically so the other people will kill them that in was prison. Pretty gnarly. Um, pretty gnarly. Feels a little bit too far. 
And I guess maybe that was the point he's trying to make is that Batman's going too far, but like, mm. it just doesn't, it just doesn't resonate with me. Um, and that was sort of the problem I had with Man of Steel is that he, I don't feel like Zack Snyder understands who Superman is and what, mm. what people love about Superman. And that's why I think people are so divided about that film. Yeah. And I don't think, you know, that carries over to this one and I don't think he understands Batman very well. And, um, you Batman know, does use a lot of guns in this. He movie. Uses now, granted, some of those guns are in a dream sequence. Yeah, but he he, he does. Now let's let's clarify this for yeah. people who may not be big long term long time Batman fans. Okay. Batman has used guns. He has. He has. Um, if you go back to early Batman comics, he just flat out like if he is left with no resort, he will kill a villain. Yeah. Um, and he will use a gun. All right. Um, whether it's on the Batwing or whatever. Yeah. Actually, I, I read one of the early Detective Comics. There's like this really big kind of kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde moment with a with a character um, who's like kind of turned into a bit of a monster. Ooh. And Clayface? He's, nope. Uh, Clayface is a fairly recent as of the 90s. He oh, was okay. he was created in the 90s. Um, uh, so Batman's flying his like bat plane the bat wing well, i don't think it's called bat, bat wing back plane, then whatever but yeah. you want to call it he drops a rope that's got a noose on it catches the guy by the neck and there's actually a panel where the guy is just dead you see like f- from far away you see Whoa. the plane with the rope and like the silhouette of the dead body just hanging from it as that's it goes through that's gnarly yeah so it's not that batman doesn't kill and it's not that batman doesn't use guns yeah i think that over the last um you know, ten years, fifteen years or so, we've we've become um, a society that consumes a Batman that doesn't yeah. use guns. Like you know, a, a gun killed his parents, so therefore right. he doesn't use a gun. Um, so that's Always not able to martial arts his way out of it, right? So that's not historically true about Batman. Okay, but he uses he uses guns quite a bit and kills people, and he kills people in a way it's not like he doesn't have a choice sure he drives into a car and completely wrecks it into like a mobile home like a like a construction site office yeah. type mobile home then he puts a grappling hook into it and continues to drag the people in that car i'm assuming they're already dead um I through don't the streets of metropolis yet. and then he uses that like yeah. kind of like a catapult and swings it around on top of another car. <laughs> Everybody in both those cars is dead. I would think so. He does a lot of stuff like that in the film. Yeah. Um, and it really does. It really just didn't sit well with me and didn't really feel like Batman. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just, it, See, for me, it felt like Batman who's just been pushed to the edge of his limits now. Like, it's like, you know, he's kind of got to do these things or else things are only going to get worse. And Alfred sort of alludes to that, like, a lot in the film. Like, yeah. you know, sorry if we're hitting spoilers. I'm trying not to say anything too major. But um, he, he sort of alludes to, like, how much further are you going to go? Like, you're branding mm. people now. Like, where else are you going to take this? But there was a lot of, like, there's some other inconsistencies in the film with Batman. Like, um the cop that had never seen Batman before the cop. I'll try to be a little vague about the scene. Cause I don't okay. want to ruin the scene if people haven't seen it, but there's a cop who had never seen Batman. So he sees him for the first time, truly treated it like Batman was a new character, but he had been in Gotham city for 20 years. Ah, so like you would have felt like he would have been a little bit more prepared or a sure. little bit more ready. Uh, and not so surprised that Batman had been there. And I think I understand what you mean people were referring to him as the devil. Yeah. You know, like I get it. He's scary, but like, I almost Batman's have been wonder. around before at this point, people should be excited and happy to see Batman in the Batman mythos. I almost wonder if those devil comments were a bit of a jab at the fact that daredevil released on Netflix roughly at the same time. And Ben Affleck played daredevil. And Ben Affleck did indeed play Daredevil, and he once kind of played Superman. I don't think so. I think I think it was. I you don't think it was a little bit of I, like I we think know Daredevil's going to be out around the same time. I think Let's it's shoddy writing. I think it's just bad writing, is all. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff like that in the film that I I wish that I I want to see. I love Amy Adams as Lois Lane. Sure, I've always said that before they cast her, I was like Amy Adams as Lois Lane. 
I don't think they're using her very well. Hmm. And I think she's had one scene in both films yeah. total where we've seen the potential of what she could be as Lois Lane. I I don't like this idea talking that... talking about the bathtub scene. No, nope, not talking about the bathtub. I'm talking, talking about in the about first film when she gets off the helicopter at the beginning of the film and she's like, this is not a dick measuring contest, gentlemen. And I'm like, hell yeah, we got Lois Lane. I don't even remember that. Yeah, it's like they're up in the... In the ice, Arctic Circle? The Arctic Circle, okay. yeah. Okay, now I kind of do remember um, and I was like, yeah, Christopher Maloney's this is, in that scene. This is, this is Lois Lane. Yeah. And then they proceed to just completely do away with that. She never has any more dialogue like that. Mm. And she basically, from that film through this film, is a character who falls. Yeah. Or a character who... Um, a damsel in distress. Yeah. And that's not what I want out of Lois Lane. Especially not this day and age. Yeah. They do, they do so much changing of the Superman mythos. Yeah. That's doesn't. That's not helpful. Like they spend so much time explaining how much how he's an alien. He's an alien. He's an alien. When, like the whole point of him being raised by the Kents is yeah. to give him humanity. Did you see the meme going around? No. Of uh, little Superman from, I think uh, from the Christopher Reeve movies mm-hmm. and. Arthur Kent being like, son, like you got all this strength and all these powers. Like you're going to have to, you're going to have to use those to help people when you grow up. And then another one of a young Superman. Oh, from Smallville. And you know, uh, Arthur, is this dead Arthur Kent? No, Jonathan Kent. Jonathan Where'd Kent. I get Arthur Kent? From? I don't know. I don't know either. Jonathan Kent, uh, played by John Schneider of the Dukes of Hazard in that one. He's like, you got all these powers, son. You're going to have to use those powers and this strength to help people. Blah, blah, blah. Right. And then, the kid from Man of Steel talking to Kevin Costner, and he's like, what are you saying? I should have just let those children die? And then it just says, maybe. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, his father in that first film is not nice to him in yeah. the film. Yeah. Um, he's kind of just like, hide it. Hide your powers. And like, he's and he's so aggressive. Yourself. He's so aggressive with his son. He doesn't do it in a sweet way. Yeah. And they spend so much time like showing that as a kid – Like he's made fun of and he's the weird kid in school and he has all hard time and nobody likes him and he has no friends. And it's like, why would he want to save humanity? Like, like they, they, and they, like I said, they beat us over the head with this idea that he's an alien, the whole film. And, uh, yeah, they don't, they don't do much to fix that in this new film. I almost feel like talking about Batman versus Superman is making us sad. It makes me a little bit sad. I mean, should we talk about a new movie? We could. I mean, it, I, we could go on and on for really uh, about this Batman Superman movie. I will say... Because there's a lot to complain about. I loved the Senate hearing scene. I didn't yes, see... Yes, the I'm Grandma's just, Peach Tea moment was freaking great. I, I will say that, that how that scene resolves itself... Yeah. Um, I didn't see was, that coming at, at yep, all. Yep, was excellent. So that's all we'll say about that. Yeah. Um, Grandma's I, Peach Tea. I, oh, I will, there are two more things I want to talk about. Oh gosh! Okay. the the big The big battle at the end of the film. Yeah. Don't love that. I feel like it was just hammered in there, like just kind of smushed in. All right. Didn't need to be there. I don't want to like go into detail about it because it'd be a big spoiler. Um, did not like Wonder Woman in this film. No, um, she's pretty. She, you might be the only person that I doesn't like Wonder Woman. I she's not Amazonian in any way. They put her in these model esque dresses, like she's she comes off as a piece of eye candy to me and she felt that she felt shoehorned into the film she did not feel like she was a part of the film mm. i felt like they had initially they probably had a batman versus superman script and yeah. then, they, then they were like well let's add wonder woman in to set up this justice league thing yeah well now we need something to have them fight so we'll shoehorn this last battle in yeah and it just didn't feel natural and the the little hints that they gave about the other characters for Justice League. Yeah. Um, I can do it. Also felt shoehorned. Those characters completely. They, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, they should have been credit cookies. It should, they didn't have one. And right. that should that scene should have been in the credits. And, yeah. and I think I would have felt better about that scene, but seeing those things. If they do that, are they just flat out ripping Marvel off? Who cares? They're ripping Marvel off. Care. Everybody knows they're ripping Marvel off. Yeah. Everybody knows that they're trying to cash in on Avengers. Yeah. Everyone knows that. Even people yeah. who aren't very movie savvy get it. Let's move on. This is making me sad. Yeah. DC's all mixed up. 
Suicide Squad, I'm very iffy on right now. I'm also going into that with low expectations because yeah. while everybody else seems to love that trailer that uses Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. I like the trailer. I don't. I'll tell you what I liked about the trailer. Yeah. So let's, we'll, this will be the last DC thing we talk about. We'll All move right. on to a different movie. Um, we, we, we can also wrap this podcast up anytime time, too. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at the time. We'll do one more movie after this. Um, I have not been looking forward to Suicide Squad. And yeah. a big piece of that is I love the character of Harley Quinn. Right. I grew up watching Batman in the animated series, which introduced Harley Quinn. And um, I've been a big fan for a long time. And when they cast Margot Robbie, I was yeah. like, nope, 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 nope. This no. is not right. This is not the right casting. She's too, like, she's, like, too hot yeah. for, for Harley Quinn. But Harley Quinn is supposed to be pretty hot. It, she's just also psychotic. Yeah, there's something about her. She, there's something vacant yeah. about Margot Robbie. Because deep down, as ditzy as Harley acts, right. there's something very, very smart it's about her. She she knows she's what a she's doctor. doing. She's a doctor. Right. For crying out loud. Although, you know, she slept with her professor. But but still, I mean, yeah, she puts on that whole, like, weirdo, psychotic act thing So let me let me say this. To commit her crimes. I watched that, that new trailer for Suicide Squad and was blown away by how into Harley Quinn I was in this oh, thing. Yeah? I was like, she's doing looks and blowing her hair out of her face and right. doing, like, the little, like, kind of, like, little, I don't know how to, like, little jaunty move in the elevator. Right. And she's... I think her dialogue in the in I don't know if it was a prison yard or whatever where she was talking about the voices in her head. Yeah. Like it all felt like Harley Quinn. I was like, holy crap, I'm all of a sudden in cool. on Suicide Squad. And then the trailer ends and they do one last line with her and I was like, I'm out. I don't even remember what that last she, line she is. She steals a purse out of the Oh right. Out of the thing. And I'm just like, come on. Like you had me that you had me there and then you just kinda cheapen it out at the yeah. end. Yeah. Not to mention when she steals that purse, she bends over and basically shows yeah. her taint to the camera. Yeah, it's just Which it, I'm a huge fan of. But <laughs> it's an insult to the character. Yeah, I I and I absolutely do not like the look of Jared Leto as the Joker. As the Juggaloker? He, yeah, he hipster Joker, not okay. Not a fan of that. You say hipster Joker. He hot topic Joker. I, <laughs> however you want to talk about it. You know, like Here's what I'll tell you. I like Jared Leto a lot. I do too. So I hope we are in for a surprise because yes, the look of that Joker is very much like if a Lincoln Park song designed the Joker, it would look like this. Yeah. And that makes me Get sad. rid of the grill. The tattoos are so anti Joker to me. I, I can agree um, with that. The the appropriation of pop culture is not very Joker. Yeah. Like the Yeah, he should be making fun of that stuff. He shouldn't yeah. be participating in it. it yeah. It, the Joker it, is, you know, suits, really nice, yeah. sharp suits that of course are in Joker's color and you know and I mean every version of the Joker is he dresses like a mobster. And then he acts like a maniac. I don't feel like and they need this to, guy just seems to look like a maniac and act like a maniac. I don't feel like they need to like just carbon copy or like take all the ideas that have been done before. I I just don't need the character to be contrary to yeah. what we know about the Joker. Sure, you know what I mean. Like do something new, but don't do something that's sort of the exact like the type of thing that he, that character would hate. Yeah, you know it's. Again, kind of going back to like this idea that the filmmakers don't really understand the characters very well. Mm. So, anyways, let's get off of that. Let's talk about one more thing. Uh, how about this? How about I, seen... I name a film that I've seen and you tell me if you've seen it, and then we can talk about it if we have. Okay. Because uh, I haven't seen very many films I've, I've, lately. I've got one <laughs> other one in me. Okay. Zootopia. Haven't seen it. Oh, so we shouldn't talk about it. Daddy's Home. Have not seen it. Shouldn't talk about it, although it's very funny. Yeah. 13 Hours, Thirteen Heroes of hours. Benghazi. I did see it. I saw that, too. I loved it. It was I terrifying. Did... Yeah, it was terrifying. It was absolutely I don't foot know. on my chest terrifying. I don't know how uh, historically accurate it is. I've heard that a lot of it is made up. Yeah, but it was a hell of a fun, exciting, emotional film. Yeah. and And it was Michael Bay. And it was Michael Bay, and I felt I felt like someone was standing on my chest the whole time. Yeah. Because as the character Tonto asks many times, mm. are these guys friendly or what? 
Yeah, you don't know. You, you never know. Yeah, it, I mean, except there's like two bad guys if that it's, you keep seeing and you're like, oh, well, if I see that guy, then the people with him must be bad guys. But so many times it's just dudes in plain clothes with fully automatic weapons. And it's just like who? If it was not a, a white dude with a beard, yeah. they were not going to be helpful. <laughs> so scary, man. So scary. Yeah. It was hard to tell those guys apart, though. The main guys? Yeah. Oh, I didn't think so. Oh, you really? So? Yeah, because then at the end when I was trying to figure out exactly who died. I was all right with it. Yeah, I mean, I like the movie. And but... I love that more. Oh, sorry. Spoiler alert. Somebody uh, dies. <laughs> somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea that um, that now Chris Pratt of Parks and Rec yeah. has played a Navy SEAL. And now John Krasinski. Yeah. And Roy from The Office. Why can I never remember his name? It's driving me crazy. I've literally met the guy. And it's escaping. Yeah, I don't now know. I wish I hadn't said that into the microphone. I, I, I have not. But yeah, now two but, guys from the office have played essentially Navy SEALs and, and Chris and Pratt, all from the Thursday night must see TV lineup. Right. That, that's a pretty fun thing. But yeah, man, that movie is it, it. It's not for the faint of heart. No, I loved it. I thought it was great. It was a it was a hell of a ride. Um, not a perfect film or anything. Don't get me wrong. No, no. I just really enjoyed watching that film. Yeah, like if you liked Black Hawk Down, this is the movie yeah, it's that for kind you. Of thing, yeah, because it, it it pretty much is just like, hey, we're in Benghazi. From the throttle. moment the movie starts, yeah. it's it it has you holding your breath. Yeah, yeah, so intense. Um, my one gripe with the movie, mm. well, not my one, but John Krasinski, yep, FaceTimes home to his wife. Uh, FaceTime or Skype or what? How do you do Either that? way, he yeah, sure. he can see her on camera. Yeah. She can see him on camera. Where he is, it's daytime. Yeah. And he's talking to his wife and kids while they're in the car. Yeah. And where they are, it's daytime, and they're on their way to Disneyland. And I don't know if the time zones work out right. So it's probably... For him to be talking yeah. to her during the day and her to be talking to him during the day... And she's on her way to like Disneyland, which we hours, can maybe? assume is happening kind of early in the day, I would hope. What do you think? Maybe 12 hours? I remember looking it up and thinking, nah, there's no way that it would have been It was the end of the day for him. in both places. It was the end of the day for him, though. Sure. I'm just saying. I still think it would have been... Let's see. It would have had to be dark in America, especially in California, if it was light in Benghazi. I'll tell you what, I could I'm be totally look, wrong, but I remember look looking it up and being satisfied. What do I, um, I want to... Uh, you look that up. I'll name another movie we've both seen. Have you seen my phone died. Ride Along 2? Can you use your phone? My phone died. Have you seen Ride Along 2? I did see Ride Along 2. I did too. Uh, didn't hate it, didn't love it. Uh, don't think much of it. Didn't hate it, didn't love it, don't think much of it. I uh, enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, I like Olivia Munn. It's pretty dumb. I mean, um, I love... The girl who plays Kevin Hart's wife. I can still never remember her name. He's just talking about the ladies right now. I'm just talking about how hot the ladies were. In okay. It. But it was pretty funny. There were some. It was funny a moments. pretty paint by numbers buddy cop film with. Uh, I mean, I like Ice Cube. I like Kevin Hart. I like Olivia Munn. But uh, I like Benjamin Bratt. That was the guy in it, right? Benjamin Bratt. All right. So right now, it's 4 41 p.m. here. Here in America. Yeah. It is 4. Wait, this can't be right. This is telling me it's for Tuesday, April 5th. Let's see here. Oh, boy. Uh, keep talking. What's another movie you've seen that I might have seen? I, I, I don't know. I mean. This says it's 1.41 a.m. in Benghazi right now. So we're talking about. Uh, 10, 11, 12, nine hours. Only nine hours difference. So yeah, so I think it would have no, had to be dark in America no, if, if she it was w- light in Benghazi. No, she was in the morning in no, they're nine hours ahead. So if it's nine, if it's nine in the morning there, it's five in the evening there. It still could be light in both places. No. Yeah. No. If it's nine in the morning in America, it's ten, eleven, twelve, one, two, three, four, five, six o'clock in the evening. Hmm. Absolutely. Then remember, why was she that's ordering why, cheeseburgers? That's why I point. You can order cheeseburgers anytime. <laughs> I don't know. But my point was, and that was my point about how it was. It was the evening for him because it was okay. just before it was just before all the stuff kicked off. And you think she's driving the kids at about nine a.m. to Disneyland? Sure, why not? That's a fool's errand. You don't get on the road at nine a.m. to go anywhere in Southern California. Yeah. Well, we don't know where they were. I know. I'm just messing around. Yeah, you're just looking for a hole. What did we just agree on? Well, we ju- we discussed right along too. Did you see the witch? I didn't. 
Neither have I, and Let's I really want to. And now it's out of the one theater that was holding on to it it's for like two playing months. Playing right over here. I don't want to pay their prices though. Um, their prices are ridiculous. Go during the day. What are you talking about? You said you paid six dollars for the other movie. Yeah, it's like six dollars if you no, go. No, it's not. If you go in the morning, it is. No way. Which one? Absolutely, like the six or the eight. No way. Yeah. The last time I've ever looked up ticket prices there, it's always over. I would do, bucks. except my phone died. I'll it's look okay. it up after the show. I really want to see The Witch, except I keep hearing it's either the most boring movie ever or it's the most terrifying movie ever, and yeah, I don't know which both. one to see. And I'm also worried that I want to see it I, so bad. I think people also – we'll have another podcast about genres and mm, discuss genres in general. Okay. I don't think people understand what genres are. And um, I, a lot of people are like, oh, it's not a horror film. It's like, just chill out. You don't okay. understand what a horror film is. Right. Okay. I like the sound of that. But we'll talk about we'll talk about what makes a horror film. The Witch. All right, let's draw this movie. Oh, yeah. We've been doing this for an hour and a half. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. It's we amazing. usually go much longer. <laughs> well, not with one movie. We've been doing an hour. Well, yeah, but one of those movies was Goodfellas. So. Sure. And we've been catching up on, like, however many months it's been. All right. Fusters, well, thanks so much for listening. Do you want me to draw it, or do you want to I, draw it? I always like you drawing it. Okay. I'm going to really give it a good shuffle. Because you, you always do the, the eyes. The funny. Oh, my gosh. Somehow it's Dune and Hodorowski's Dune again. That is not happening. <laughs> Pick something. If you haven't yeah. listened to our podcast about Dune and Hodorowski's Dune, it's our second most recent one. There's Check it out. Check out the feed on iTunes there. You can listen to that episode as much as you want. I think once is enough. <laughs> All right. I feel like I've shuffled these pretty, you pretty a good one. well. There you go. I mean, I don't know. Oh, are you one. able to see it? No, I'm not. I just meant you had one. Ladies and gentlemen, the next movie we watch will be... Wow, it's written so small. I really want a movie that I put in there. He's really excited about I it. I have been meaning to see this movie for so many months. What is it? And recently, I heard an interview with the star of this movie, and I thought, how have I still not sat through that movie? What movie is it? Directed by the son of David Bowie. Starring oh, Sam Rockwell. It's a fantastic movie. What rhymes with Dune? Moon. Moon. All right. So let me just real quick. I was just sitting here saying that I want to. I want you to pull something that I put in there that I wanted you to see. Awesome. This is a movie that I love. Nice. That I really, really think you need to see. And I've been and, meaning and to and meaning to and meaning to. Viewsters, seriously, if you are listening to this and you've, I know some people just listen to the the podcast. They sure. don't actually follow along and do it watch and we love them just as much watch this freaking movie you will be so much better off for having seen this film it is a great piece of cinema and in the words of the character from the stand mm. m-o-o-n that spells moon yeah well I, moon, I, i'm psyched i met duncan jones at, at a screening of this and oh, yeah? uh yeah great guy great film really smart filmmaker uh, I believe it. This this movie. Ah, I'm so psyched. Sam Rockwell's performance in this movie is yeah stellar. I literally just listened to an interview with him like this past week, and yeah. he was talking about scenes from Moon, and I was just like, "How have I still not watched it? How?" Sam Rockwell is like great in a whole bunch of things. He's but, Sam Rockwell, He's but there's great. but there are some of these like smaller indie films that he really like takes his performances to a completely new level. Um, yeah. Another one I can think of is confessions of a dangerous mind. Oh yeah. I just watched that yesterday. Um, while I worked. I love that. He movie. is so great in that. And then this movie would be the next one. Um, his performance is so freaking good. In this. That's great. And he has to, he it has to be good because he carries the movie. Can you connect six degrees of Kevin Bacon? Can you connect Sam, Ro- Sam Rockwell mm. to Ben, Affleck star of Batman v Superman Ben Affleck and Sam Rockwell yep they're in a movie together yeah I was gonna say they must be in a movie together um it's one of my favorites but most people don't agree with me I don't know Gigli uh nope much earlier I don't know the movie is glory days oh okay. it's a college art school movie about never seen a it. bunch of guys about to graduate and move away from college. both in it I love that movie. Never seen it. All right. We're going to watch Moon. Yeah. All right, everybody. Get to Moon. Thanks for listening. It's good to be back. Thank you so much for sticking with us. And we will see you in two weeks with Moon. Bon Cinema.